Our next panel is on free speech. Chairing the panel is Sophie Sandor. She uh, used to work for the Institute of Economic Affairs and the Adam Smith Institute. And her documentary, School, will be coming out um, sometime next year. So uh, please join me in welcoming our panel. I'm looking forward to discussing free speech with you all. Um, today we have Yaron Brook, who you're already familiar with. Uh, the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, Sutiam Ghadarzi, the very impressive student who is very active on Twitter and has made quite a name for herself, uh, and Toby Young, one of our most famous journalists. And everyone on the panel has had an experience either with quite, quite big experiences with the debate in free speech or indeed free speech itself. Uh, by that I mean Sutiam Ghadarzi's very interesting life experience of getting to the UK. Uh, so, let's kick off this, this discussion, uh, which most recently has been characterised by, this free speech debate has been characterised most recently here and all over the world by big data and the government's role in free speech there. So, should we have to agree with those whose speech we want to protect and is it ever justified to force private companies to allow people to speak? Uh, these are all interesting questions that are ongoing, so I'll leave it to each of the speakers to give a brief introduction to their position or thoughts on the matter. Toby, would you like to go first? Um, I thought I'd just uh, kick off with a reminder about why free speech is important um, and then talk a little bit about uh, current arguments against free speech and uh, why I don't think they hold much water. Um, so. Argument number one is that human beings can't flourish without freedom. You can't have freedom without free speech. Ergo, humans can't flourish in the absence of free speech. Free speech is the foundational freedom on which the others depend. Uh, number two, um, uh, freedom, of speech in, freedom of speech in inquiry is how we advance human knowledge. It's how we uh, test hypotheses against reality. Uh, a process Karl Popper described as uh, conjecture and refutation. Um, uh, and it's equally, it's not just true of how we advance scientific knowledge, it's also the best way to arrive at uh, some kind of stable consensus when it comes to religious, political, and moral knowledge as well. And number three, and this is the one I want to focus on, uh, free speech is a bulwark against tyranny. Um, why do tyrants hate free speech? Uh, in a piece for the Boston Globe a few years ago, uh, Steven Pinker uh, explained that um, it's because opposition to the tyrant is uh, often extremely widespread, but the reason that doesn't lead to tyrants being overthrown is because opposition, the, white, the, 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 the extent of the opposition isn't common knowledge. And if you suppress free speech, you prevent opposition to the tyrant becoming common knowledge and in that way preserve the uh, tyrant's power. And I think that's kind of what's going on uh, uh, with current efforts to obstruct free speech. It's a way of preventing uh, skepticism about various progressive orthodoxies uh, becoming more widely known. I'll give you an example. Um, a friend of mine was on Question Time not long ago, uh, and it was being filmed in Birmingham. And this was around the time of various protests, predominantly by Muslim conservatives, uh, about the teaching of sex and relationship education to children in Key Stage 1, children aged 5 to 7. Um, and the inclusion in that curriculum of uh, things like same-sex marriage, trans transgenderism, and so forth. So these conservative Muslim parents didn't want their children as young as five to be taught about things like same-sex marriage in the classroom. Um, and uh, they, uh, the panelists on this particular edition of Question Time were asked who they sided with, the protesters or the authorities. Uh, and um, my friend sort of dodged the question and the other four panelists all said they emphatically sided with the authorities and against the, and against the protesters. And they, they unequivocally condemned the protesters. Afterwards, over dinner, each of the panelists separately came up to my friend and admitted that actually they thought the exact opposite, 
but just hadn't felt confident enough to say so because they thought it would lead to them being uh, monstered, defenestrated, uh, targeted on social media and so forth. That's a good example of how not understanding that your skeptical position about the teaching of things like same-sex marriage to five-year-olds, uh, your skepticism is not as widely held as you believe, so you're afraid to express your view. Uh, I think suppressing uh, this kind of common knowledge uh, takes two forms. Um, one is uh, the claim that it leads to, that if you allow people to air their dissenting views, um, uh, that those views will actually cause physical harm to marginalized groups, women, ethnic minorities, the differently abled, and so forth. Um, uh, this is often an argument made um, uh, in the context of Trump and Brexit. The claim is often made that since the election of Trump, since the Leave vote in the 2016 referendum, uh, hate crimes have increased, uh, violence against minorities has increased, and so forth. Um, I can give you chapter and verse on why that isn't true. Uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, if, you, if you include uh, unreported as well as reported hate crimes, uh, there's been a significant decline in the number of hate crimes uh, over the past 10 years, and indeed a decline since 2016. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, since the election of Trump, um, uh, America has actually become less racist, more pro-immigration. Um, uh, uh, there was a poll uh, done by some sociologists at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which found that um, uh, Americans in 2018 were actually less racist and more pro-immigration than they were in 2016. A Gallup poll in June 2019 found that 76% of Americans believe immigration is a good thing, which is the highest number to date. Um, uh, so there's, there's, and, and th th there's similar, similar evidence uh, in the UK about the uh, de declining uh, racism, more pro-immigration sentiment since the 2016 Brexit referendum, totally counter to the progressive narrative that the election of Trump and the Brexit vote unleashed demons and licensed white supremacists to commit violence against minorities. It's just not true. Um, uh, I can go into, mu I go into that in, in much more detail, but um, I won't because uh, I don't have much time. But the other form that um, uh, uh, attacks on free speech take um, is not the claim that they lead to physical harm uh, to marginalized groups, but that they lead to psychological harm. Uh, so that's the argument that um, was made um, uh, to justify firing James Damore when he had the temerity to challenge woke orthodoxy at Google about uh, why there weren't more women in tech. Um, because he challenged the progressive orthodoxy, um, he was fired, and the, and, the, and the rationale was because simply challenging that orthodoxy created a hostile work environment. That is, it made, it made the women uh, at Google psychologically uncomfortable. And this is often the argument for no platforming people at universities. Uh, the idea is that if you allow someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg to come and speak and to make the argument for Brexit, uh, that's going to be psychologically harmful uh, to minorities. Um, there's, there's, there's obviously no evidence at all of this. Um, uh, uh, social scientists have struggled to find any connection uh, between uh, conservatives being, able, being allowed to air their views and psychological harm. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that the opposite is true. Uh, in The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, uh, they, one, of their, one of their biggest arguments against suppressing free speech is that actually molly coddling students, keeping them in a safe space, preserving them from intellectual challenge and debate, shielding them from any kind of intellectual conflict is actually psychologically harmful. They leave university completely unprepared to deal with the world because they've been cocooned in cotton wool. And actually, if you want to prepare students properly uh, for life in the modern world in the 21st century, much better to expose them to as much intellectual challenge and robust debate as possible. Um, there was one, there was a recent policy exchange report on free speech by Eric Kaufman and um, uh, uh, Tom Simpson very much worth reading, um, but it, it, it found, um, it found, uh, some, interesting, uh, found some interesting things. It found, it found that um, actually if you ask students whether they think it's justifiable to no platform Jacob Rees-Mogg, they asked a representative sample of something like 505 students, um, uh, uh, 
by 52% to 38, the students actually thought no platforming free smog was wrong. So clearly a majority in favor of free speech. And when they were um, read a statement making the case for free speech, uh, then they broke 63% to 30%. Um, uh, and interestingly, uh, uh, there was a poll carried out um, a couple of years ago by the LSE and Opinion, uh, which found that 76% uh, of people agree with the statement, uh, sometimes political correctness goes too far and exceeds common sense. So I think there is a silent majority out there who are not only supportive of free speech, but who are quite skeptical about uh, a lot of progress orthodoxy, particularly the wilder fringe, fringe of progressive orthodoxy. How do we empower these people? How do we give them the confidence to speak up? How do we uh, create uh, common knowledge that they exist and that there is this skepticism and that people are generally much more uh, conservative in all sorts of ways than, uh, than, than, than we're led to believe? Well, I'm, I'm trying to start something called the Free Speech Union. Uh, which is going to protect people, uh, 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 protect people's speech rights, and come to their defence um, if they do end up um, facing punitive consequences for expressing a dissenting point of view. If anyone here would like to join or find out more about it, or if anyone would like to help, looking for website designers, um, please email me at jsmillsociety at gmail.com. That's jsmillsociety at gmail.com. And uh, we hope to launch in the new year, but uh, appreciate any help I can be given. I think that is the way, uh, that is one way anyway, that we can encourage people uh, to speak out more in favor of free speech and against progressive orthodoxy. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. And I look forward to hearing more about that new society. Uh, Suti, um Right. Thank you for having me today. Um, this is a great opportunity. And I think I would like to expand on, um, on what freedom of speech, or what the attacks of freedom of speech actually entail in modern society, in modern British society. And I think today, in this day and age, we run the risk of thinking that we are actually free and we can actually speak our minds merely because the government doesn't set particular rules that stop us from speaking. But there is something even worse out there, and that's, that shows itself in our education system, where children are literally being brainwashed into thinking a particular way. Um, and if they do speak in, if they do present their views in an alternative way, they are reprimanded, they are told off, and the teachers use their authority to silence these dissenting voices. And because simply because it's not the government doing it, we can't see it. If they are reprimanding your children, you have no control over what's happening. And I think, certainly, because I'm a student at the moment, um, and I see this quite often, I've had so many teachers who come out and express a particular view, and they don't let you speak out about it. Um, certainly, a lot of them had, you know, used to tell me off for voting Tory. I mean, I don't vote Tory, but, like, you know, I can't vote yet. But um, they used to tell me off for supporting the Tories because apparently it's heartless, it's cruel, <laughs> and you know that I'm, a, I'm an evil person for doing it. I actually, recently, I've had a bit of a spat with my college because they've come out with leaflets. Um, they, they're distributing leaflets which encourage students to vote tactically for a people's vote, um, and they're not letting they're not letting alternative leaflets which support Brexit to be distributed within the college. So they're only allowing a certain viewpoint to be presented as students, and the students don't have any, any way of escaping that, um, especially the ones that aren't politically engaged. That's the only narrative that they're being taught, and that's the only narrative which they are allowed to express. Um, so I think that the biggest challenge we have today, as conservatives, as right-wingers, as, and as people who actually support non-biased um, a non-biased education system, the biggest problem we have today is what goes on be behind the scenes, not necessarily what the government is legislating at the moment, but what the teachers are doing, the sort of institutional suffocation of freedom of speech when it comes to the education system and any sort of taxpayer-funded system, where we are putting our taxes into this, these systems and all they're doing is using their platforms to brainwash our children, to tell them what to think and to stop them from speaking out simply because because they're vo they are descending voices. And I think, Toby, you are absolutely right about the fact that they are scared. They're scared of having alternative opinions. They're scared because, actually, if we do have freedom of speech, 
you know, we can dismantle their arguments so easily, and they don't want people to see that. They don't want people, they don't want people to know what the weaknesses in their own arguments are. So they feed one narrative, they feed one particular narrative in order to get their own way. And I think it's such cheap politics, it's such cheap democracy. And I think we need to really start thinking about solutions to these problems. Thank you. Um, got lots to say about both of you and both of what you've mentioned, uh, but Yaron, I'll let you. Yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, there is no issue more important than the issue of free speech in the world today. It is a precondition for anything else that we fight for. If we can't speak our minds, if we can't challenge the status quo, if we can't present radical views often, then we cannot win any other battle. So of all the issues that uh, we confront in the world out there, those of us who are fighting for freedom, there's nothing more important than, uh, than free speech. And unfortunately, free speech today, at least in the United States, is under attack by both the left and the right. Uh, both uh, would like to see the voices that they disagree with silenced in one way or another. And it's, it, it is truly disheartening in the land that has the First Amendment, and thank God for the First Amendment, because if not for it, I think free speech would be even more under attack in the United States today and be in real regression. Um, it is really disheartening that the state of free speech, and survey after survey shows young people saying that they don't believe in the First Amendment, that, that, you know, that, that, that there should be some... Uh, uh, movement away from it and hate speech should be banned as it is in Europe and, and I think in the UK here. But what is hate speech? Who gets to define what hate speech? This is the problem with any kind of form of regulation of speech. You, you have to establish an authority to figure out what is okay and what is not. Somebody has to decide. Um, you know, the arguments, uh, the arguments about speech uh, are ludicrous. On the one hand, you know, speech is not violence. F speech is not physical force. Uh, you know, suddenly speech can be violence when it is inciting violence. But, you know, we've already got laws against inciting violence. There's, there's nothing new about, about the idea of inciting. And often, again, you know, it's selective in terms of how we apply those laws. We, we apply them only to some acts of incitement and not to all of them, uh, depending on the politics. But I, I think the stronger argument that the left, particularly the left, has is uh, is about the emotional damage, right? That that you know people get offended. Well, get a life, right? Get a spine. Um, all new ideas, all innovation, all progress, all truth is offensive to somebody. Certainly, Galileo was offensive to the Catholic Church. Newton was offensive to all the people who. Who, who believe differently about, about the laws of, of physics. Tesla is very offensive to the taxi drivers in, in the UK. You cannot advance a truth without offending somebody. And there's no way human knowledge can progress, can advance, without a protection, a solid protection for freedom of speech, without somebody viewing what you think as hateful but you having the protection against those people and the ability to speak in spite of it. And I think, so I think our priority needs to be first and foremost to look at government and to make sure government doesn't in any way infringe on these rights. I, I agree completely that our educational system is where this really gets manifest and it's, it's you know, where, where, where I think parents are afraid to speak up, teachers are afraid to speak up, and most teachers are then, in a sense, trying to brainwash our kids in, in particularly ideological ways, and it's very difficult to stand up against them. Uh, a large extent, I think that is made possible by the fact that the government has such a strong monopoly over education. I think a competitive educational system, an educational system that is much more geared towards parents rather than towards teachers' unions and political interests, would be an educational system that, that freed that up and made that you know, a non-issue. I think even at the university level, so much in the United States at least, so much of what, uh, of what happens at the university is, uh, is, is ultimately 
kind of at a third and fourth level, but is regulated by the state in one way or another. And, it, and the, the, of course, the, 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 the second aspect of that is the fact that the left has dominated their universities. The left has basically taken over our universities, and therefore they dominate every aspect of what happens at the university level. And of course, where do teachers get trained for primary school and for high school? They get trained at the universities. They get trained with one dogma. And again, what we need is competition in order to, uh, in order to get rid of that kind of monopoly power that our universities have and that the state has over what our kids, our kids are thinking. I also think there's a threat now, unfortunately this one is from the right, to violate companies' property rights, and in a sense their, their, their free speech rights, by uh, attacking them and, and now a willingness to kind of try to dictate to them what, they, what kind of speech they should allow and what kind of speech they should not allow. The fact is that the freedom of speech is also the freedom not to have on my platform certain points of view, not to have certain people speak on my platform. We all exercise that. Oh, all business owners, like, like this theater here, I mean, it, was, it would be quite legitimate of the theater owner to say, I don't want any Ayn Rand spoken in my theater. I don't like Ayn Rand, and I'm not renting my place out to people who are going to talk about Ayn Rand. It would be completely legitimate of them to do so. I think they'd be wrong, but it would be within their category of free speech and property rights to be able to do that. And the fact that now we are, the right is advocating for some kind of egalitarian uh, speech uh, on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere um, is, I think, just as damaging and just as destructive as what the left is trying to do and would be horrific if it was actually put into practice. I mean, it, it, it scares me today that there is a complete political uniformity and agreement about the need to break up big tech whether it's in the name of free speech or in the name of monopolies or whatever, or too much power or whatever it is, both the left and the right now are, are, are in agreement about, uh, about intervening into the marketplace and breaking up, um, breaking up these, I mean, amazing companies agree or disagree with their politics. Uh, they have changed our lives, I think, for the most part, uh, for good. So. I think, I, I think we need to be very wary of any attempts to silence anybody. Um, and one of the, I'll just mention this, the one role of government is to protect speech from violence, uh, to protect us from the violent actions of those who would silence us. And I think one of the ways in America at least, and I think in the UK to some extent, but certainly in America, where the government has failed is to do exactly that. And I'll just mention, uh, that this goes back to really the late 1980s where, uh, with Solomon Rushdie. The fact that when the Ayatollah put a fatwa on Solomon Rushdie, basically told an author of a book that they, were, they put out a contract on executing this guy. And the fact that Western countries, like the United States, said nothing, did nothing, and basically when bookstores in the United States were fire, were attacked, for selling Solomon Rushdie, Bush's response was, he shouldn't have written the book. I mean, it really is offensive to religion. We shouldn't offend religion. Same thing happened with the Danish cartoons. Uh, when, when there were demonstrations and there were threats and there was threats of violence, Western governments did nothing indeed. Again, another Bush, the son, apologized and, 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 and said, oh, shouldn't have published those cartoons. No newspaper in the United States would publish the cartoons, partially because they feared being attacked and they, and they feared attack for good reason because the government would not stand by them and defend them. And when Antifa attacks today and where security stands by just watching as people are silenced, when physical force is actually used against people speaking, that is the one role of government is to defend. That's the one role in speech is to defend a right to speech against violence. They have defaulted on it, and I think that has led to the slippery slope where speech is not considered that important anymore. Um, and it's, I, I think we're all in danger, Europe more so than the US, of this, uh, the effect of government silencing us or not defending our ability to speak. Thank you. Um, Garen, is one of the biggest problems then, because it seems we need to convince people that free speech is good, but one of the biggest challenges seems to be convincing people who want to suppress free speech that it would be bad if the people they disliked had the powers they want people they currently like to have those powers. 
they struggle to imagine that. It seems to be some kind of illusion that people are under, that only the people they like will have these powers. I mean, yes, there is a, there's a certain mentality that exists today, which, I, you know, it's a pre-enlightenment mentality. And it's a mentality that there is an authority out there, that there is truth. Uh, you know, it used to be the church that had that truth. Today, it's uh, leftist academics who know what's true. And it's okay to silence everybody else because everybody else is garbage. It's, it's untrue. It's, it's heresy. It's, it's, it's useless. It's not going to actually promote the discovery of truth because they already have the truth up there in the, in the ivory tower of academia. So it's almost impossible to convince them who've abandoned the idea of reason, who've abandoned the idea that truth is accessible to all of us, because they believe that truth is only accessible to a certain minority. It goes back, I mentioned this in a previous panel, it goes back to Plato, it goes back to this idea of the philosopher king having some kind of spiritual ability to, to, to discover the truth through revelation, or, the, or in religion you have a very similar thing, but the left today has embraced that notion that they are the arbiters of truth, they are the authority, and any challenge, it's useless. Yeah, it's offensive, and it doesn't actually promote any goodness, right? So the right, the right or, or those who advocate for, for uh, I don't know, for, for capitalism or for freedom in any kind of respect, you know, all they do is damage because we already know what's right. What do we need all this stuff for? And this is a very pre-enlightenment uh, pre-enlightenment attitude. I mean, the idea that free speech is crucial for human liberty because it is an expression of human reason and we must be free to think and therefore we must be free to express our thought is a new phenomenon. This is like what, 250 years old to 300 years old. It's a product of the enlightenment and unfortunately we reverted against it and we, we're in many respects we're turning against the enlightenment and I think we do so at our peril. And, uh, and free speech is just one manifestation of that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why, Toby, this has become such a block for us, being able to convince people, you know, it really would be bad if, if people you didn't like had these powers, so they should be able to empathize with those of us who are trying to stop anyone being able to suppress free speech, such as the government? Um, well, it, it used to be the case um, that the left was pro-free speech and uh, most of the challenges to free speech came from the right. Um, and uh, left-wing advocates for free speech, like Matt Hentoff, the famous Village Voice columnist, um, constantly made the point that free speech isn't just for... Uh, uh, it isn't just uh, for those who currently um, aren't uh, in the ascendancy, ideologically. Um, it's important for those who, who are, who are um, uh, not in the ascendancy. Um, uh, and he, I think he came up with the phrase, uh, free speech for me but not for thee, to sum up uh, that attitude, uh, that it only applied uh, to a kind of dissenting minority at the time and not everyone. Now that conservatives have become a dissenting minority, the left have generally abandoned their commitment to free speech, not entirely, um, but certainly they're much less enthusiastic about it than they were. Um, I just wanted to pick you up on one point of fact. Um, we don't have any laws in the UK at present uh, specifically prohibiting hate speech. Okay. Um, there are um, forms of illegal speech um, that have been designated hate crimes, uh, but any, any, um, anything, any, any, anything against the law can be designated a hate crime uh, if in the view of the victim or anyone who witnessed the crime, the perpetrator was motivated by the victim's membership of a particular protected group. Um, uh, there's actually a really good, I think, I mean, uh, uh, an interesting question is, um, if you are pro-free speech, what should be your attitude to hate crimes? Uh, uh, and um, I think there's a really good argument made against the concept of hate crime uh, by Jonathan Rausch in his book, uh, Kindly Inquisitors, which is a, a great, uh, passionate, pro-free speech uh, essay. And he makes the point that to say that some crimes should be punished more severely if the perpetrator is motivated by hate um, uh, is to 
criminalize certain kinds of feelings, certain thoughts, um, and that is effectively to create a category of crime which amounts to thought crime. Now, it's not quite straightforward as the crime being a thought crime because you can't be punished merely for having a bad thought. But if you punish someone more severely, because if in the course of committing the crime they're having a bad thought, then that is effectively creating hate cr uh, a thought crime. So for that reason, I think that um, defenders of free speech should be opposed to hate crimes. Thank you. Uh, Sutium, I've heard so many examples like yours of teachers only advocating one view in the classroom. Uh, but there, as far as I know, there's supposed to be a law protecting against things like that happening. You know, if they express one view and give information about one ideological side, they're supposed to balance it out as far as that's possible. Um, so do you think it's more an issue that the law just isn't being uh, instituted? Oh yeah, definitely. I think the problem is a lot of people don't want to implement that law. A lot of people don't take it up. And actually, students don't have the money to take it up. You know, you don't, they don't have the money to go and sue um, the college or their high school because you know they've said one of the teachers has said one mean thing about their political opinions. It's the Education Act 1996, I think, um, and. And, and that's a problem. And actually, linking back to the question that you said earlier about um, why we can't convince people why freedom of speech is such a good thing, I think there was a recent study, it might have been by the Telegraph, that came out, 70% of young people don't know who Mao is. Um, I think it was something about 50% don't know who Lenin is. <laughs> and actually, if people, if, if students, and you know, these people are going to be um, the future of this country, if these people don't know what authoritarianism is like, if they don't know what it does, if they don't know what banning free speech does to a country and what it does to themselves, then obviously they're not going to see the consequences. They're not going to be against banning free speech simply because they don't know that it's bad, simply because they don't know the consequences. And I think that's where the problem is. The law is there. It's not being enforced because it's almost impossible to enforce it. A lot of people don't even know about the law. A lot of the students don't even care. And if this is not being enforced and a generation of the future is being brought up not knowing the consequences of banning free speech, then we are in deep, deep trouble for the future. Can I just um, follow up that point? Very good point about, um, uh, I think it's more than 70% of students uh, don't know who Chairman Mao was. Uh, and as you say, the reason that's alarming is because if they don't know who Chairman Mao was, not enough of them know about the crimes of Lenin and Stalin. All they've been taught is about the crimes of the far right when they've been taught about fascism and Hitler and so forth. Uh, then they're not going to treat Jeremy Corbyn and people who espouse similar dogma um, with um, the right kind of appropriate suspicion. Uh, and a good example of this was um, Jeremy Corbyn, I don't know how many, how many of you are aware of this, but Jeremy Corbyn was on the Mar show uh, last year and they were discussing um, what had brought about the rise in China's economic fortunes. And Ma was making the argument that it was largely because the current communist regime has, in important respects, departed from communist dogma when it comes to economics. And Corbyn was challenging that view, and he said he thought the most important uh, thing um, which had led to China's current prosperity was Mao's great leap forward. Oh, Jesus. And um, <laughs> Dominic Lawson uh, wrote a column in the Sunday Times in which he pointed out uh, that 46 million people um, are estimated to have died unnecessarily as a result of Mao's Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward took place over a four-year period. Um, in a comparable four-year period in Nazi Germany, six million Jews were murdered. So roughly seven times as many people were murdered in a four-year period, effectively, by Chairman Mao. But because 70 plus percent of students don't know who Chairman Mao is, Jeremy Corbyn can perfectly innocuously uh, praise Chairman Mao for having killed 46 million people and not lose any votes, certainly not amongst 18 to 24 year olds. Wow, okay. Yeah. And they want to silence our speech, right? I mean, talk about offensive. I mean, there's nothing more offensive than that. And where are the voices of the people who do know? 
Because this should be yelled from everywhere. The guy just praised Mao, one of the praised greatest that. murderers in human history. The greatest mass murderer in human history. That's yeah. his Bible. Wow. Um, I'll open it up to questions in a moment. I've just got one more question for the whole panel about which was sparked from City. I'm talking about the education system and you feeling more confident about free speech in general in this country. Should we not... There's a lot, there's a huge amount to be positive about relative to the rest of the world in the UK with free speech, of course, but we are creeping towards the public and politicians wanting to regard private entities as public entities so that they can be liable for things that are happening on their platforms. Uh, so it's one of the main problems that, and does it get most bad when free speech is being suppressed in public entities and spaces like the education system and where the government is allowed to regulate. Um, so, so is it is it worse because because free speech is under attack in the public space as well? Uh, yes, and should we worry about private entities becoming public I mean, entities? Yes, I, I think we should really worry about the government regulating speech on Facebook. Nothing good can come of this. I mean, how are they going to do it? Are they going to count how many conservative posts they are versus how many liberals? Or who gets deplatformed and when and under what? I mean, they're talking, they're truly talking about commissions who will then sit and decide whether the platform has been okay in, how many, in, in what it's deplatformed and what it hasn't been okay and who gets to choose the commission. And the commission then has the power of government. So uh, I, think, I think one of the worst things possible for the cause of free speech is any attempt to regulate or censure these platforms. Uh, I think the best way to regulate or censure the platforms in a market sense is don't use them if you don't like them, right? Or, or start a new platform as Jordan Peterson just has or as uh, I think, I think uh, um, uh, others are, go you know, are going to do. Or just stop using Facebook. You really hate them that much, right? It, it, the, the, the more we get government involved in these things, particularly with the tendencies of politicians, both on left and right, the more control and the less free speech we will get. And once we sanction their ability to regulate speech on these platforms, it's all over because we've sanctioned their ability to regulate speech in any platform. Uh, you know, and, and we're already seeing that. I mean, uh, I completely agree about the left's complete hostility to free speech. Well, but when the President of the United States talks about going after Amazon because they own the Washington Post and he doesn't like what the Washington Post is writing. Oh, when he calls, he calls all the media fake news. I mean, some of it is wrong and it's certainly biased, but fake is something completely different. That's manufactured and made up. But when you're doing that, even if, even if some of us view it as, yeah, finally somebody's calling out the leftist newspapers, this is the president. This is the guy with a gun. This is the guy with authority. When suddenly the government is then telling us, oh, this is good news on some days Fox and on other days, you know, for the right wing uh, thing. And these are bad news organizations. And this you should, I mean, the government should have no opinion about what happens in the press. No opinion about what happens in the press. And if you don't like your coverage, then present the facts as you see them without having an opinion about the press. And when government has an opinion about the press, it legitimizes the idea that we, it's okay then to shut down. And indeed, even, unfortunately, on the right in the U.S., opinion about free pre freedom of speech is declining. I think because some of this rhetoric, I think because the vilification, and as much as I hate the New York Times, I think this is nutty what, they, what, 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 uh, what Trump is doing in terms of vilifying the New York Times and legitimizing that attitude Towards uh, towards uh, towards the press, I think it is very in a very very scary direction. But do you think it's a free speech issue when private companies ban people? No, it's not a free speech issue. I mean, I can I can invite anybody. I mean, I, I believe you allow you should be allowed in your private store in your private business to discriminate in any way you want. Uh, I think some discrimination is irrational. I think what Facebook has done on occasion is irrational. I think what, what, what Twitter does, I mean, I know that YouTube suppresses, the algorithm suppresses my stuff because it's, uh, because it's, you know, it's not politically correct. I know that they don't, 
they don't allow me to use advertising on some of the videos. Most of my videos are fine, but some of my videos, and, and it's, it seems to be if I offend the right too much, if I offend religion too much, or if I offend the left too much, I don't get advertising dollars. But that is not censorship. Censorship and, and, and attacking free speech could only come from those who hold the gun. Everything else, and, and education, I think, is, is it's an arm of government because the government is so involved in education. But these are private, you know, private enterprises. They should have all the right to discriminate in terms of view, the views they represent or they don't. And I actually think what, what Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are trying to do is very difficult. I think we trivialize it. Oh, they're against conservatives. But it's very difficult. They're trying to keep up certain points of view that are, uh, that, 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 you know, Al-Qaeda. They don't want Al-Qaeda. On the other hand, they're trying to keep away pornography. I mean, there's just a debate on one of the channels that I follow about nude art. And uh, Facebook is saying some of the nudity in the art might be pornographic, and they're not sure because they have, uh, they have machines do it, right? It's not even people. It's AI trying to figure out what art is nudity and what art is pornography. I mean, how do you do that, right? But so a, a human eye, I think, can tell the difference, but a machine has a hard time. So when you challenge them, they often say, yes, that's okay. It's a very tough job for them to decide what they want and what they don't want on their platform. I don't think they're doing a good job. I don't think they're very clear about what their standards are. I don't think they're abiding, uh, they're, they're, they're being very objective about how they do it. But that's, you know, they're not doing a good job, so I don't like them. So I use Facebook less than I would probably otherwise use them because I don't think they do a good job. But it's their business. They can do whatever the hell they want. One thing to alert people about, if they're not already aware of it, uh, is the uh, white paper that was published earlier this year uh, called Online Harms. Um, and uh, it was published by the Home Office, I think. Um, and it proposed to create, either to empower Ofcom to regulate the internet or to create a dedicated internet regulator. And if you read this proposal, this white paper, it was full of absolutely horrific details. Uh, so for instance, it wanted to empower either Ofcom or this new regulator uh, with the ability to fine a social media company 10% um, uh, of its annual profits in the preceding year uh, if it publishes hate speech or fake news or indeed anything that anyone judges offensive. So that would be a recipe uh, for much, much heavier policing of speech by Facebook and Twitter and on YouTube and so forth. Um, and it didn't define, of course, hate speech or fake news um, uh, with any precision. And bear in mind that if it's Ofcom that is empowered to regulate the internet, the head of Ofcom is appointed by the Secretary of State at DCMS, how, how long would it take before, if this, if this regulator was created and we had a Labour government in power, um, the new Secretary of State at DCMS uh, decided that anything that was critical of the government constituted hate speech and threatened to fine any internet provider, any social media company, indeed any newspaper or magazine that published anything online that was critical of the government, 10% of that company's annual profits. It would soon uh, eliminate criticism at a single stroke. Hopefully, uh, this won't actually come into existence now, even though it's strongly supported by Sajid Javid and was strongly supported by the last Conservative government. I hope Boris will uh, throw it out. Um, but just, just if it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean that speech uh, on the internet isn't already being policed by the police. Um, a, 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 this, I mean, this is an extraordinarily sinister development, but uh, the Times ran a piece a couple of years ago. They submitted an FOI request to discover uh, how many um, uh, online uh, crimes had been investigated by the police in 2016. And it turned out the police were uh, questioning, detaining and questioning uh, seven people a day in, in 2016 uh, for online crimes, things like misgendering on Twitter. And the police designate, designate I, mean, I said earlier that there, was yet, there wasn't yet a category of um, hate speech which was legally prohibited in the UK, uh, but there is something called non-crime hate incidents, 
Uh, now, the police can legitimately question you if they suspect you of having committed a non-crime hate incident. So it's not a crime, it's just expressing a point of view that they think might lead you to, at some later point, commit a hate crime. They're like the precogs in the Minority Report, uh, anticipating what people are likely to do, and on that basis, interviewing them and warning them about the kinds of things they've said on Twitter or on Facebook. And in a really sinister development, it turned out last week uh, that Humberside police, when asked, to, when asked for an enhanced DBS check by a teacher or a care worker or someone proposing to go into those professions, actually included non-crime hate incidents uh, in the person's enhanced DBS check because they, they form part of that person's record even though they're not actually crime. So effectively, if you've misgendered someone on Twitter, uh, it might be that you couldn't get a job in Humberside as a teacher or a care worker, which is absolutely shocking. Yeah, it really is reaching insane levels in this country. Did you want to add something, Sutium? And then we will open it up to questions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to Yaron's point about um, freedom of the press and um, freedom of private companies to um, essentially allow any type of speech they want. And I completely agree with you. I think that actually Twitter is a private company. They have the right to allow um, speech that they deem appropriate on their platform. If you don't like their platform, leave it. I've deactivated Facebook. I can't deal with it. Um, and I also agree with you. I don't think the government should be intervening at all. I think that private companies should be left alone. They are <coughs> owned. Um, they are owned by shareholders, and they get to decide what goes on there. But in the UK, we've got something different, because we've got the BBC. <laughs> and, that's, and that one is we're literally forced to pay for it. And I think that when people, um, when the taxpayer, in one way or another, is forced to pay for something, then their views should be represented equally, and they should have, um, they should have their views represented. And I think this is a big problem at the moment. Whereas a debate, the left are claiming that the BBC is biased towards the right, and the right are claiming that the BBC is biased towards the left. Probably differs depending on the programme. But I think that the BB and I think that this is this does get quite tricky because the BBC does need to remain balanced. The BBC does need to uh, provide services which make um, which make the taxpayers happy at the end of the day. And I think we really need to think about reforming the BBC in a way in order to make more people happy with the services, because I just feel like people aren't from the left or the right. Well, this is why the state should own no media. I agree. I mean, and the BBC should be privatized tomorrow, the sooner the better, because you cannot achieve that balance. You cannot please. So, so the, as soon as the state has any form of, from Pravda to, to, to the BBC, the state should never be involved in news production in any form of media. Uh, let's have some questions. You were first with the glasses on. Hi. Uh, well, I just want to ask about uh, if the panel agree with me or not on uh, the words Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, homophobia, um, and many other words has been created just to shut down freedom of speech because uh, you can't criticize any, uh, any religion these days in any organization you go. I mean, I think it's, it depends, right? Some, I think anti-Semitism is a real thing. I think there are people who are anti-Islam for the sake of being anti-Islam. Um, I, I think you have to judge it based on the context, but I think in, but, but yes, it's also used to shut down debate, right? Uh, certainly in America now, if, if you you know, lots of points of view are, are criticized as racism and that's supposed to shut you down. And yet there are people who are racist, so, a part of the use of the word in that way, uh, you know, makes it very difficult to differentiate the true racists from just the left throwing that word around against anybody they disagree with. They actually diluting its use. They're actually making it more difficult to combat real racism. If you called anybody an anti-Semite, then when they're real anti-Semites, you can't you can't actually attack them. So no question, the left is using those words, and it's actually making the phenomena that's really behind it, in a sense, worse because you can't combat it anymore. Yeah, the um, the big test for me um, when probing how committed I am uh, to free speech, the big test I. I asked myself is um, 
would I defend the free speech rights of a Holocaust denier? Um, my father-in-law is Jewish, um, lost some close family members in the Holocaust. Um, and I think, yes, I would. And the reason I would is because the best way to expose the claims of Holocaust deniers as toxic nonsense is to allow them to air them in public where their evidence can be challenged and where their claims can be contradicted. Um, uh, much better to have a robust debate, much better to allow them a platform so their ridiculous nonsense can be comprehensively debunked by the evidence than to uh, force them, than to ban them, uh, which, may, which may in fact um, uh, extend the life of their claims by not exposing them to the disinfectant of public scrutiny. And I think it was, it's the same argument for allowing Nick Griffin to appear on Question Time. That was protested by 500 or so people outside the BBC. Uh, they said that the BNP was on the rise and allowing him a platform would only fuel the growth of the BNP. Actually, it had the opposite effect. By, ha by giving him a platform, by allowing him to be challenged by other panelists and members of the audience, um, actually, it debunked a lot of the nonsense that the British National Party uh, were saying. Um, and shortly after that, the British National Party nosedived uh, in the subsequent election. I think it lost all its council seats and its two MEPs. So actually, the decision to allow him to appear on question time was good precisely if you oppose what he stands for. So, so I will just add to that that, look, slippery slopes do indeed exist. And the first form of speech that was banned in Europe was Holocaust deniers. But once you give anybody that authority to decide what nonsense is, they're going to expand the definition of nonsense. And soon, you know, sane positions are viewed as nonsense by the authorities at the time. So I, I absolutely would defend the Holocaust deniers' right for, for the reasons articulated. But on top of that, because nobody should have the authority to decide with the power to enforce it, with a gun, what is nonsense and what is not. Absolutely. The more people hear of these nonsense proponents, the, the more other people dislike them and they dig their own grave. Uh, so it does us all a favour. Um, yes, you at the back. <coughs> uh, I think Sutian point, touched on the point I want to make, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear people discuss it. Well, we've talked about the BBC, we've talked about free speech in various arenas, but it, I've, just, I've put two young women through university in Britain in the past 10 years, one through the University of Cambridge and one through the London School of Economics, and was absolutely horrified by the fact that I was paying to have my daughters indoctrinated. There was absolutely no question that Britain's universities are captive. I mean, they've been taken over. In her first term studying politics at LSE, um, the very first seminar was on Plato, surprise, surprise, and I immediately looked out my copy of Karl Popper, The Open Society and Its Enemies, volume one, Plato, volume two, Marx, and said, you might like to read this. And she said, our lecturer has already told us that, Pl that Popper is completely discredited and anyone who mentions him with approval will be failed. <laughs> this is term one. There's no question of a discussion about it. My other daughter, who was at, at Cambridge, I was very active in student politics. I was president of my student union and stuff when I was at university, and I suggested to her she might like to do the same. And she said, Dad, I want a good degree. If my dons realize I am not left wing, I will not get a good degree. That the heart of darkness for free speech in Britain is absolutely in academia, and something has to be done to liberate it, because we're all paying for that. These are public spaces. We have no choice over it. I mean, those are hair-raising stories, but they're certainly not unusual. Um, in the policy exchange report I mentioned earlier, which was specifically about the um, uh, assault on free speech in Britain's universities, it found that um, just 39% of students um, who thought uh, Brexit was a good thing felt comfortable airing their views in the classroom at university compared to 89% of Remainers. Uh, and actually, I was surprised that it was as high as 39%. Um, the, uh, the, the authors of that report make various uh, recommendations, um, all of which are very sensible. Um, but uh, I think 
Um, one, one way to, uh, one of the suggestions they make is that um, uh, universities should um, have to make an explicit commitment to free speech. Many of them already have. Um, but, uh, and uh, the Office for Students needs to be empowered uh, to make sure that the commitments they give or have given to upholding intellectual freedom are prioritized over creating an emotionally safe space. Often universities say, yes, we're committed to free speech, that is in our founding articles, but we also have to have an eye to the emotional safety of our students. And for that reason, we do have to prohibit microaggressions. We do have to no platform people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and so forth. Um, and it needs to be made clear to universities by the government in some way, possibly through an act of parliament, certainly could be done by empowering the Office for Students to do this. It needs to be made clear to universities that they have to give absolute priority to intellectual freedom and can't balance it against the emotional safety of students, which has to come second. Um. I do think this is a massive, massive problem, but I think that actually this is, this is in a way the fault of the right. I feel like we haven't done much at all to combat it until um, today. I think that actually we need a student-led movement against this. When I first came out about the fact that my college was um, distributing people's vote leaflets, um, I went to the principal and I told him that this is actually illegal and that I will get the media involved in this if they don't stop either handing those leaflets out or getting new leaflets um, which support the Brexit side and distributing them alongside the people's vote leaflets. And I think that actually a lot more students need to do this because if we have all the students who support Brexit, 16% of universities and students um, support, want to support Boris Johnson in this election. That's plenty. If, if all these students stand up and say that actually we believe in this and you cannot inhibit my freedom of speech and you cannot do this to me and you cannot kick me out of the course, then actually I think we can genuinely make a difference and we can genuinely enforce this into universities. It's just that we're not doing much at all and we're not giving this issue much attention. We talk about it, but no one does anything about it. And I think it's genuinely becoming a fault of the right at the moment. That we're letting the left take control of this. We're letting them dominate the discussion in both universities, colleges, and in high schools. But in the, in the long run, the only solution to this is to replace the bastards, right? It's uh, because a professor can say, I mean, I was a professor, and, and, and sure, it's completely legitimate for him to say Karl Popper is a nobody. I, I, don't, I don't respect him in academia today, and nobody publishes articles about Karl Popper, so who the hell is him? I'm not going to teach him. And students wouldn't even know he exists, right? So even if they're allowed to speak, they don't even know that those ideas are possible. The only way, ultimately, is for more better people to go into academia and replace. The fact is that the left, for 100 years, has systematically come to dominate universities. And uh, I know this in the United States, but I'm sure it's, it's everywhere. And uh, as long as they dominate the universities, you can force them to be balanced, but they're not going to be, right? <laughs> you know they're not going to be. And God forbid that, again, the government gets involved in the curriculum and says, oh, you have to have a, a, you know, a, a class on call Papa. We don't want that. Right? So, so the only way to do it is to actually get our voices heard, partially through students, activism, and partially through, ultimately, replacing the professors at the universities. As long as the universities are dominated by these leftists, this is what we're going to get uh, in one form or another. We, we have to do more to emphasize you know, academic studies among people who think differently. Too many of us give up on the academic studies because it's, because it's hard. Uh, one, 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 one tactic which has occasionally been used successfully is to persuade wealthy alumni yes. to withhold donations uh, from universities that don't uphold free speech. And that worked in the case of Oriel College, Oxford, um, when it looked as though it was going to succumb to a Rhodes Must Fall campaign and pull down a statue outside the College of Cecil Rhodes when the alumni who uh, were intending to give money that year objected and said they were going to withhold money and write the college out of their wills. If they did take down the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the college very quickly backed down. Uh, though I, I was at a, a, a conference um, in Oxford earlier this year um, to discuss 
ways to protect intellectual freedom in Britain's universities, and this came up as a potential way. And uh, Amy Wax, uh, an American um, law professor at, at Penn Law School, who's uh, got into um, uh, various difficulties uh, for saying politically incorrect things. She wrote a piece in the, co-authored a piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer, Defending Bourgeois Virtues, and was immediately damned as a white supremacist, and uh, petitions were got up at her college and so forth. And she said that trying to organize rich alumni to um, withhold donations uh, is very difficult. She said, first of all, um, lots of alumni give money because they want to secure places for their children or their relatives' children at the college or university in question. Secondly, she said that lots of these alumni are themselves quite liberal and are sympathetic to the university's apparent concern for protecting the emotional safety of marginalized groups in the university and don't think that free speech should be prioritized over that. And she said, even if they do actually believe in your cause, um, their wives are likely to be <laughs> liberal. Um, uh, and they won't want their husbands to be associated with a, a campaign which uh, the left will immediately tarnish as alt an alt-right uh, astroturf organization created to defend hate speech. And she said that their wives might end up threatening to withhold sex <laughs> unless they donated to their old colleges uh, if, they, if they dared align themselves with a group like the Free Speech Union. So she thought that was, a, that was the road to nowhere. That tactic wouldn't work. Uh, we have just under five minutes left, so one more question, please. Yes, you. Oh, maybe? Yes. I work in further education, not higher education, um, and I'm glad to work in that sector. I would not want to work in the university sector at all. Um, I've got a question. Basically, at one time, it was between 8 and 10% of the population here in the UK who went into higher education. You now, I think, have got something like 55% of the population who are going into so-called higher education. My question is this, although it seems some of you are saying, well, it's all the fault of the professors, I want to throw the question out and say, well, is it maybe more the fault of the bureaucracy that surrounds these institutions, which is going back to the kind of debate we had before about, um, well, I mean, basically Lucy Harris was talking about being an MEP and the kind of quangoism which goes on there. So that's my question. No. Brief answers, please, and wrap, also include your final thoughts, if you wish. Sure. No, my view is it's 100%, it's well, close to 100%, the fault of the faculty. And it doesn't matter how many people go to university. The fact is that intellectuals shape our world. Uh, if, if a news organization wants an expert opinion, they go to Cambridge or Oxford to get an expert opinion. When a politician wants an expert opinion, they go to Cambridge Oxford to get an expert opinion. Uh, you know, we are... We are as a culture, we are, the intellectuals dominate the culture. They shape history. Ideas shape history. And if you lose the, the, the commanding heights of academia, if you lose the intellectual commanding heights, you lose the battle long term. You might win a few battles in between, but in the long term, they come to dominate. And you, you, have, to be, you have to take them on. You, now, I'm not saying the bureaucracy is, is, is good. The bureaucracy is terrible, and it partially sustains the left's hold on the universities. But it is these leftist professors, uh, it is the ideas that they hold, and it's the fact that we are so timid in challenging those ideas. We need to be a lot more aggressive, we need to be a lot more certain, and we need to not just attack them for their ideas, we need to offer alternative ideas. We need our own, uh, our own intellectuals, our own set of intellectuals who can replace those guys. And until, until they're not replaced, they will still dominate much of our culture to our detriment. Um, I think you raise a good point, actually, because part of the problem that we have is the government doesn't push um, alternative methods of education enough. So apprenticeships or going straight into work. So a very big majority of students do go to university, but a lot of them do, don't 
end up being intellectuals. Because at the end of the day, a degree in gender studies is not equivalent to a STEM <laughs> degree. And if you get a degree in gender studies and don't get a job, you're going to end up blaming the government for not having a job. So it's, um, I think it's time that we start thinking about alternative ways of education because a lot of courses at university could be vocational courses um, and I think we need to start thinking about how we can offer them because a lot of students do would actually benefit more from vocational courses and it would give such a boost to our economy if people didn't waste three years of their lifetime going to university when they could learn the exact same skills better in a vocational course. Yeah, well, in support of your, your point, um, the uh, policy exchange um, authors asked their um, respondents um, who they got their opinions from. And only 1% said they're university lecturers. Um, and something like 67% said social media. Um, I think it's multifactorial. I think that the overwhelming left-wing bias, particularly in the humanities and the social sciences has definitely played a big part. And it's become much more biased in the past 25 years. I think it used to be that um, registered Democrats outnumbered registered Republicans by a ratio of something like three to one uh, until about 25 years ago. And now it's something like eight to one. And in some departments, it's 33, 50 to one. Um, in some American universities, there are simply no registered Republicans at all in any departments. Um, and, uh, and the same is broadly true here, too. So I think that's certainly a, a, an important factor. But the, the growth of diversity crats, diverso crats, I think they're called, um, uh, is certainly a factor as well. Um, uh, things like Title IX in the US, the Equality Act here, create um, obligations, legal obligations on the parts of higher education institutions, um, that they employ these vast armies of diversocrats to enforce. And often um, that involves um, suppressing anyone who challenges um, uh, particular progressive orthodoxies uh, on campus. So I think that's definitely, that's definitely a factor as well. Um, I hope that some of you will be interested in, in helping me fight back by joining the Free Speech Union. Um, as I said, I think we're, we're, we're hoping to get the company registered uh, next week. Uh, we're hoping to launch uh, the website uh, a couple of weeks after that and get the actual organization properly launched. Uh, the date we're going for is the 21st of January, which is the 70th anniversary of George Orwell's death. And as I'm sure you know, uh, George Orwell was a great champion of free speech. And if we want to hold the BBC to account, um, we can remind the BBC that outside broadcasting house, there is a statue of George Orwell, and the words under that statue I think are something like, if liberty means anything at all, it means telling people, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. <laughs>